Okay, welcome everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce you. I am Nerde. I am Ian. Ian. So if I asked him today how to pronounce it correctly. Ian, Ian is the head of Schumacher Institute for Sustainable System. He has a very rich, uh, very rich background, uh, counting in masters in uh, mathematics, in uh, masters in uh, uh, operational research, and masters in responsibility and business practice. He has been working for American multinational. He has been president of system, UK System Society for three years, and he has been he co-founded the charity called. Converging World that is installing energy systems and planting trees in India. Ian, please welcome and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I'm, I'm here to talk about um, quite a few things, I think, but it mostly centered on the idea of, of systems thinking and what systems thinking is and, and how I see it. Um, but very slightly, just a little bit to start with about um, myself. Um, as I say, I'm the director of the Schumacher Institute for Sustainable Systems, which sounds wonderful, but we, we are a, a fellowship, um, and we are devoted to trying to continue the ideas of E.F. Schumacher. Uh, and I don't know whether many people in, in the room here know about him at all. Anybody heard much about him? One, two, right. But Schumacher was um, a famous economist, and many people credit him with being one of the main protagonists behind the environmental movement. He's a little bit of an icon for environmentalists, uh, mostly because he wrote a book which had a wonderful title of Small is Beautiful. Um, and he really was looking at local action non-violent methods, simplification, and appropriate technology was a very central issue for him. But more, more than that, he sort of encompasses the idea of an economist who suddenly woke up to the idea that economics isn't about just money, it's about people, and how we treat people, and how we embed them in a living system where they are, they are central, and money flows and financial transactions are there to support human development. And which is why the subtitle, as you can see there, is a study of economics as if people mattered. And that was his main message of making sure people were central. And that's what we tried to continue with his work um, over the years since he died. And we are now what's called a, a think tank um, based in Bristol. Uh, there aren't many think tanks outside London, um, but we are one about the only one I think of it that actually exists in Bristol. Um, we work as a fellowship. There are 160 fellows around the world of all kinds, all kinds of disciplines. Uh, and some of us never meet. Obviously, you know, nowadays we do so much electronically. But as a fellowship, we work with the ideas of sustainability and resilience. We're very much with a, a focus on the future and what's ha actually happening and what things are, are developing and coming towards us. And you may ask, what does a think tank do? Well, we tend to spend a lot of time holding up large sheets of A4, A0 A paper with lots of scribbles on it. We sit around tables and we discuss things and we work that way. So um, think tanks are there to try to influence people. We try to make a difference somewhere, whether that's in local governments, uh, within business world, or in central government, or wherever it might be. We're there to sort of move outside the normal boundaries and think differently, and that's what we try to do. To, uh, Mary asked me today to come along and talk a little bit about uh, things, uh, systems thinking. I, I said, well, what I'll try to talk about is that we all think in systems all the time. We're all aware of the connections um, and relationships that are part of our environment, our culture, and we express ideas and have our values. These are all part of what we call systems. But there are many 
tools, methods, methodologies, and even philosophies around systems thinking that help us do this in different ways. Um, and it's never-ending. It explodes in all different directions, the way we can think about systems. And there's hopefully never going to be an end to it, a never completeness to the whole thing. Uh, what I'll also do, I'll talk about that first and then talk a little bit about um, a project we did with Natural Resource Wales, um, about a, started about a year ago, um, which is very much about the farming community here in Wales and how systems thinking helped that process along, however little bit of influence we might have had. We help people see it differently. So I always start talking about systems thinking with putting against a little bit of contrast to what it's about. And Francis Bacon is one of my heroes. I love a lot of what his thinking was of his day. This whole concept of the world could be reduced. We can find out how things work by cutting them up in little bits and finding out how the little bits work all the way down to the bottom. The reductionist process is extremely valuable. And many people in the systems thinking world tend to sort of pass it over there and say, oh, reductionism, we don't like that. We're about systems thinking. Well, I don't adhere to that idea at all. And I think reductionism is an extremely valuable part of systems thinking. It's just that there's so much more than that. So Francis Bacon, who started what you might call, again, a little bit of an icon of what you might call the Enlightenment period. Well, we're about systems thinking, and you can put in all kinds of ideas around this, um, whether they are ways to structure problems, how to understand what's going on, trying to re reach into the issues that people have to identify problems, um, to help with modelling it, to sort of bring in knowledge from all sorts of different areas as well. And some methods are what we call very soft, and some are hard. But underlying it all is this really interesting word of complexity. Um, my definition of systems thinking embraces lots of other names that people use for this field. So I tend to often call it system sciences because um, there are sort of people who hang their, their hat on certain labels with this. So system sciences is probably more appropriate for me. And when it comes to complexity, I just love this little... Little uh, diagram. There's a little picture here. Yeah, back in 1996, if you went into a coffee shop, you could have black or white coffee. All right, nowadays, you name it, there's probably many more names of coffee up there that, that aren't up there. Um, and that's, in a sense, you could call that how complex our world's got. In actual fact, that's not complexity at all. That's called complicatedness. But let's uh, let's not worry too much about those sort of definitions. But. Uh, I just thought I'd like to sort of start with that. Um, I also like to see systems or system effects everywhere. And there's one here which I love. Um, this is a picture out on the factory, the digital factory. And you can see there is a flowing through there across these mud flats. And you can ask yourself the question of where did that come from? I don't, I don't think that's me, <laughs> <laughs> we, we see a, a meandering pathway for the water to flow across this landscape here. What actually happened? Before that little, that little bit of river stream was put existed, it was flat. The water started to flow and there were some very, very minor differences in the topography there that started to make a channel. And as more water came down, it found it was easier to follow the existing pathway than the one before. And so that channel got deeper and deeper and deeper. And so it formed that, a really clearly defined channel. And it's a process we call Analyzation in systems, its path dependency is really easy to follow a route already established and easy to follow. And there's a pattern we see, and the patterns are 
really important for consistency. The pattern we see everywhere, it's always easy to follow something that's already established and is completely really clear. And we all do it in our daily lives. It applies to people as much as it does to a, the natural world. It is me. I think the speakers are on, but I haven't turned them on. <laughs> Another lovely picture that demonstrates patterns we see in life. Uh, there, there are two ones in this one. I didn't realize it originally, but I was just trying to get a picture of something called a network effect. And we have this sort of diagram, tree structuring, branching process of a leaf and how it gets its nutrients and how it captures the light. And it's a lovely sort of symbiotic relationship with this natural environment. But that sort of tree structure, we, we see this everywhere in, in the world, whether it's in human affairs or the natural world. Now, one other thing I did notice when I was watching this and trying to take a picture of it, was that it was fluttering. And that reminded very much of the fact that it fluttered in a certain pattern for a while, and suddenly it switched to a different pattern. And this was a very classic issue within chaotic systems. They can stay in one state quite a while, and you think it's stable in that shimmering, us, and suddenly it'll flip to another one. And we never know quite why, but if you get into chaos theory, you'll see these patterns are what actually happens when you're just on that edge of things. So that was another lovely sort of pattern I saw in systems. Just turning off the, yeah. the sound, yeah. Uh -huh. But that would be there. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that can work. <laughs> okay. I, I was Let trying to find that. a number of the reception, but. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, otherwise I'll go. I'll go and see someone. There isn't anything here. Oh. Um, that was a call. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, can, I can carry on if you like. Um, yeah. Wait, it's not on full screen. It doesn't make a sound. Are you sure? Yeah. At this moment, we are. Yeah, turn. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Maybe you are right. Yeah. I can go with that. Yeah. Right. No incriminating yeah, notes. Yeah. That's okay. Let's try that. Well, how strange. Yeah, let's do that. Who knows with systems? We all have to figure out ourselves. The idea of this, this picture, and I collect, I collect photographs of old machinery that's decaying. I just love the concept that we build things, they have a lifetime. That was once a very functioning tractor trailer, is now being reclaimed by nature. So a lot of systems is about flow of time and change. So although we analyze systems, we really need always to put them in the context of how it's going to be different as time moves on. Because everything has its life cycle. A lovely trailer, I imagine the farmer when he bought that was really pleased. He got a brand new lovely trailer, but look at it now, slowly being captured by nature again, it'll disappear into the ground. Really important aspect there. Um, this is another concept. In York Abbey, the Old Minster, I mean, they've got a lovely children's exhibition of how the minster was built. And you've got this lovely little toy. You can put the blocks on top of the wooden structure in the middle, put them there, put the keystone at the top, and then you can pull the formwork away, and it stays up there. Absolutely lovely demonstration. And to me, that's another 
really important aspect of systems is that they constructed on top of each other and they're all dependent and you can take away the bottom bits and the whole thing stays up there. And I use this a lot when we're talking about resilience work within a city in particular because we have built a colossal infrastructure that supports itself and the underlying bits of it have gone away. A lot of knowledge we had about the existing systems and how we construct them has disappeared. But this big system, 5G network coming next on top of it all, exists and stays up there as long as we can keep it up. So that's a, another really important picture to me. And of course, um, coming from Somerset, I couldn't not show you a picture of the levels and the starlings and the patterns they flow through the air as they, as they settle down to roost for the night. Absolutely phenomenal uh, kind of demonstration of complex behavior coming from a very, very simple set of rules. And the rule is for each bird, it says, I'm not going to bump into anybody else. And that's about the only rule they obey up there, flying around, and they never do. Well, they probably might once in a while when the wind blows too strongly. But most of the time, it, it completely generates itself, this wonderful pattern in the sky, and then it's gone. So that, um, that to me, is a lovely example of, of systemic nature of our world. Coming back down to the human, this complex behavior, um, I won't recommend we do it here today, but this is a little game I sometimes play with people to demonstrate complexity. You get a group of people, about this number will be really good, but you need quite a large space. And you give them a rule which says, pick two people in your head, don't tell them who you've chosen, and place yourself halfway between them, exactly halfway between them. Right? And that's all the rule is, and you see what actually happens. That the whole room starts swirling around as people jostle, and as somebody moves, they have to move because they want to keep halfway between it. And you get this wonderful pattern actually happening, a terrific, sporadic nature of it. People shift over there suddenly, sometimes split into two groups, and then they'll come back again, and it moves, and it never stops moving. <laughs> However much, somebody, somebody always has to sort of inch themselves away, and just, the whole thing sets off again. Wonderful behavior. I recommend doing it. It's a great party breaker, icebreaker. Yeah. <laughs> Except for one situation, which I did here with a group of people in India. Um, I was trying to talk about system thinking with them. I said, let's play the game. There's a lovely space to do it, as you can see. The only problem was there's a hierarchy within their organization that said we will always be looking out for the big man, and the big man was there, and everybody chose him. And this system settled down into a perfect circle, as you can see it, like a circle. I thought, I failed, <laughs> but I hadn't, because the nature of the rule was very different for them than the one I was playing. So rules are very important within this, this whole game. And uh, moving on into sort of methods around systems, that uh, visit I played, play, uh, paid out to India was to help them with their work within the village communities in which they, they're working all the time, this, this NGO out there. And we spend a lot of time starting off the process of systems thinking, almost all the time I start off with rich pictures, as we call it. We get people to sit around tables and just draw out on that piece of paper in front of them how they see the, the thing we're trying to discuss, the, the system, in other words. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what you put on it, you can write words if you really want, but it's much nicer to actually draw physically what you can see, what, how things connect, and you make up these sort of diagrams. And, uh, and then you hold them up and you all talk to them, and by the end of that se session, you've exchanged a great deal of perspectives on what's going on. It's the starting point. And this is really the process, as I say. We're trying to at, at, at tackle, in many cases, what I call omni-shambles. Omni-shambles is a new word in the, in the dictionary which means pretty much what you think it does. It's an awful mess, way beyond any kind of mess you've ever come, come across before. It came from an interesting TV series, political TV series, an omni-shambles. 
is what we're dealing with most of the time. And this is a little definition I use, which is a, it's a super wicked social and environmental mess uh, with histories. Very important aspect. It, everything has a history. Syst history of systems is wonderful. It's full of divergent problems. They, they don't converge on a solution. They get worse and worse. They're large, multi-scale, political, culturally diverse, and we all hold back from contributing. One of the main problems I have with systems thinkers is that everybody involved in it keeps their knowledge and holds it back. They don't share enough about what's going on. Um, so, and you have a constantly changing game with diverse players, each with their own knowledge, and the, the modifying the rules all the time, and out of this totally new and totally unforeseeable phenomena emerge. So this is a working definition of what systems thinking is trying to tackle all the time. So the shorthand is an omni-shambles. And we often sort of think about systems thinking in terms of, of, of layers. This is a classic diagram called the systems iceberg. Uh, sorry to interrupt, you still have any issues with the speakers? Uh, well, we've gone to this mode and it seems to work. But if we go to full screen, it doesn't. <coughs> we get the crackle. Do you want me to interrupt or should I come back after you finish? Sorry? Do you want me to have a look at it or should I come back after you finish? Okay. Maybe you can just, uh, I will put it on full screen. And if it does again, then you can. Yeah. <laughs> and in the practical lecture, as we know that it's working, maybe. Okay. Uh, okay. Then. Okay. You go, you go I, I'm okay if everybody else is. Yeah. Okay, then thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's better to follow you. Okay. So this is a, a, a well-known model in, in the systems world. It's called the iceberg, where at the top you have the sort of the events that are going on, the things you can actually see within the system, and we react to those. But there are patterns of systemic behaviour lying beneath that. And then beneath that we have what's called the design layer, where we look at the structures within the system of what's going on. And down at the bottom we have our mental models and the assumptions and the key things that determine what's above us. And that's the layer of what we call the transformation layer, which is where we are concerned so much with systems thinking is about how to make a change. Intervention in the system is the name of it. Uh, it it's wonderful academically to understand how a system might work, but in a think tank environment that I come from, our mission is to affect a change somewhere. And we hope it's for the better, but we're not guaranteeing it will be. So systems thing, where did it all start? Well, of course, we, whenever you want to trace back something, you end up getting back to the Greeks as being the key to it all. And there were some very interesting philosophical foundations of systems thinking, um, where the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And the one I love so truly is that you can't step into the same river twice. It, the river's moved on, the water's different every day. Um, and Socrates, we know nothing except that we don't know. So that's, these are sort of really interesting philosophical backgrounds to it all. In terms of the history of systems thinking, maybe the early 20th century, there was a blossoming, a beginning of it all. Uh, the general systems theory started up there. Ideas around cybernetics, the concept of control systems came in. Systems engineering, the beginnings of complexity science, and things like operational research, which um, is, a, is a mathematical, had a real blossoming during wartime because the idea that you could get scientists to work on making better bombs and using those bombs better than they did before really stimulated. And we all know that defense stimulates so much of our knowledge and our innovation. But after the, post, after the Second World War, you know, 70 odd years ago, there was a bit of an explosion within management sciences in particular about using a lot of this stuff to improve the way business operated. Um, for those historians, probably one of the most famous set of conferences, we call the Macy Conferences, from all the way from the late 40s <coughs> through to the 60s, and some of the really big names in systems thinking and cybernetics came together to exchange ideas and really make things 
start to, to happen. Um, one of those men was uh, a chap called C. West Churchman, who started a sort of looking at the human side of things a lot within systems, and particularly the, the ethical questions uh, around it. And, and he's really uh, quite, quite famous for um, the phrase which says that you can never really understand a system until you can see it through the eyes of another. That's one of the little catchphrases we have. Seeing the system through the eyes of another person is extremely important. Um, and we have all these different ways of actually viewing the systems uh, and becoming aware of the circumstances around it, whether we take an analytic view, ethical view, whether we're looking at it from decision-making or social views or scientific or beneficial or universal. You know, there are loads of different viewpoints which you can take. So it's so important within systems not to be stuck in one thing. I'll go on a little bit with this. Um, this is a lovely diagram put together by a friend of mine at a conference we went to, um, and it shows the sort of different disciplines that feed in to different parts of systems thinking. So if we look at, um, you know, yeah, let's start at the top, the general systems theory, we have ideas coming from biology, maths, physiology, economics, sociology, philosophy, process philosophy, all of these fit into the, roughly into what we call general systems. We have um, the range of interdisciplinary studies, the complexity sciences, and you can see the sort of track as a sort of a timeline that starts to develop. You have these different disciplines, but they all sort of merge into different sections of systems thinking. Um, so this is a really in important little diagram to sort of try to understand that systems thinking itself isn't just one thing. It's multiple things, and lots of things can come in and out of it. Um, it is truly interdisciplinary, or you might even say it's, it's what's probably called transdisciplinary. It, it, it arises above disciplinary uh, ways of thinking. Um, just because well, what came here today was looking at very much in an ecosystem world, we are very concerned with bioecological systems as well. But I like to always place this in the context of the person in the middle and the <coughs> child in the middle. And I recently went to a, a, a talk last week where we had um, a young lady from the Commission here in Wales for Future Generations. And for me, trying to place future generations at the centre of what we're dealing with is, I think, extremely important. But we're full within the systems thinking world of diagrams like this that sort of show how things are embedded in each other and we work out from the central point, the most important thing we're dealing with, into the larger scale all the time. And also within that ecosystem world we deal with these sort of patterns. Um, is anybody uh, are you familiar with panarchy concepts here of the way that you have a sort of successions through an ecosystem as it develops it from sort of early stages, becomes more mature, more mature, and it eventually becomes really mature and old, and it starts to then fail in the sense that the species that have actually taken over dominate everything, and that suddenly collapses. But that doesn't mean the end of it. It goes back in, and we start a new cycle going round and round. And each time those cycles change, the whole thing can shift up a layer and keep going upwards. It's a very complicated way of describing the dynamics of ecosystems. And I would certainly suggest it's very, uh, very appropriate for the kind of work we're, we're trying to deal with, which is looking at sustainability issues. And another influence, because I've, this is something actually that's not just because I've been invited along today into the design thinking world, but we are actually, uh, in a project I'm involved with at the moment, we are actually bringing in design thinking as a particular new way of looking at systems. And that's the nice thing about systems thinking, it's always open to sort of new developments and new ways of actually uh, dealing with things, where we try to have this sort of flow, but always feeding back on itself all the time, where we empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test, 
and hopefully some of the prototyping we're going to be seeing will be tested and we'll see how we have the feedback at the beginning. And I've seen this today very much, the process that's going on of design thinking. Um, I'd like to also chuck in that there are other things as well. There's uh, lots of developments within um, the Operational Research Society, which I've also been a member of very many, many years. We like to think that we work very closely with communities as well as with the business world. And we have, again, this sort of cycle all, all the time of coming up with ideas, planning, going back and re-testing -te and seeing how we can adapt it and going round and round. Um, other aspects which, uh, again, this is based a little bit on the project I'm involved in at the moment. We are looking at concepts like actor network theory um, and agent-based modelling where we deal with the actual entities, the people and institutions involved in the system and we try to map them out and connect them and we look at the way that they sort of, um, the relationships between them develop and change over time. So this is another huge area and I think the, the whole field of network analysis and network thinking is really important for the way systems are going in the future. Um, and I think I'd say that particularly because of the, the technology that we're dealing with at the moment is increasingly moving us into a world of thinking and networks uh, as being extremely important. The digitization of our world at the moment is heading that way. And what we can actually do nowadays with data and processing power that we've never been able to do before lends itself to network analysis. Um, now another very famous person within the systems thinking world uh, is Donella Meadows and she was very instrumental in setting off a lot of thinking around system dynamics, the way things shift and move and connect with each other and flow. Um, very much the beginnings of the work on limits to growth which we um, now used so much as a, a sort of benchmarking tool for what we are actually, ha it's actually happening to the economy and the world in terms of sustainability. And she came up with this sort of concept that once you've got a picture and a model of the system, where can you find places to intervene? Where can you actually make a difference? And she came up with sort of 12 different ways of changing a system. There may be more. Starts right down at the basics. I call this tweaking the knobs. Just tweaking the knob a little bit here, tuning things in a little bit, and you made a change. At the other end of the scale, you have complete paradigm change. You actually change the fundamentals of what this system is supposed to be, and, and you almost start again with it. Um, so, this is a nice model that's often used to try to decide where you can intervene in a system. Um, and archetypes, I think this is an important aspect of system thinking, is trying to find patterns of behavior, like the channel through the mudflats. That pattern is, is what almost a, an archetype in there of reinforcement, a reinforcing loop that's creating that channel. And we see it in so many different aspects of the world. Patterns and pattern language, uh, I don't know how much you've looked at that in, in, in the kind of work you've been doing, but um, again, it's recently come into systems thinking as being a really important part of it, and also applying pattern language concepts to systems thinking itself. So there's a very nice lot of work being done on that in that field. Right. Um, and again, a lot of what we do in the Institute is around system dynamics modeling, trying to look at how things connect, trying to parameterize that, look at the equations that connect some of the things, and see if you can get as far one day, we haven't really achieved it very often, of actually putting the thing into a computer model and seeing how the model behaves so you can understand how the system might change as you alter it. We've done a lot of work on the, the economy um, this way. Um, just like to throw in another thing that Schumacher wasn't just an environmentalist or an economist, he was a philosopher, he was a very religious, spiritual man, and he was very much in, interested in what the meaning of life was. And he wrote another book, not just small, it's beautiful, it's called A Guide for the Perplexed. 
So uh, if anybody's interested, I'm starting a new science. It's called perplexity science, as distinct from complexity science. And it's all about how do you actually deal with dilemmas and contradictions and the conundrums of this world. Um, because we see that so often in our world we have concepts that are described as, as sort of lock-ins. These are the addictive processes that, that, that sort of trap people. They have names like the deadly embrace, the deadlock, addiction, technical word for it is schismogenesis. Um, and, and, and that leads to polarization as well. And these processes in our society, in our world, I think are the real fundamental problems we should be dealing with and trying to work with. And they all fit in this really perplexing concept. How do we deal with complexity? Perplexity. Um, a distinction we make in systems thinking between a hard system, and often it is that hard, it's actually uh, septic tanks, or uh, this is an anaerobic digester out in India. Um, it's stable, structurally mostly, you can model it, you can get data from it, you can see how, how it works, you can put it in a computer, and then you can try changing things around. It's a very hard system. But we also have um, what we call soft systems. We're very much dealing with the human side of things, the abstract, and how people see the system. There are physical elements to it, but you can't remove yourself completely from the physical world, but it is often structurally unstable. It can shift quickly, and you can't model it. Data is very patchy, and all of it is judgmental. And we use lots of soft system methodologies in this field. So those are two categories, hard, soft. The third one I often work with a lot is called the critical systems thinking side of things, where we, come, we recognize that we can't understand it completely, never can. Not that, not that you know, we haven't done it yet, it's just that you can never understand it completely. And you, we can never intervene with any certainty. So let's get rid of the concept of certainty in everything. It isn't there. How do we deal with that? How do we move on is what critical systems is about. And it's always about a sort of this sort of seeking improvement, an organic way of actually working forward, seeing what might emerge if you were to change things, asking some very difficult ethical questions about what ought to be the situation as to think of what it is. So that's another branch to that. And just to throw in, lots of other methodologies everywhere. Um, some wonderful ones. Well, I think the, the idea of positive deviance is lovely. Looking for where things are really good in a system. How come that works so well for those people? What's the, what's the formula behind them for success? Um, appreciative inquiry, again, carries on with that mode of thinking very much about what is good about the system. Can you improve it and share that more widely? But we actually have a, a whole list of other angles on systems thinking ways of doing things. Um, permaculture concepts have come in very strongly on that as well. Um, so, very quickly again, four types of systems thinking. Functional, can we make it much where, where the hard systems mostly lie? Objective approach, can we move the system that way? Interpretive, trying to get shared perspectives and mutual understanding on the system. Critical or, or emancipatory is often called ensuring fairness, looking at ways where, where certain people are marginalised and discriminated against and asking those difficult questions of why is this actually happening? What's, what's leading to that problem? And the last one is an interesting one. It's often labelled postmodern systems thinking and it's all about creativity. It's all about sort of jumping into a different world altogether. It's emotional connection with things, understanding that you can actually try and experiment. And this is where we bump into wonderful disciplines, much more on the humanities side of things, of the art and cultural ways of actually looking at what's going on. Um, right, I think I'll just jump that one because that's a bit difficult. Um, so some of the challenges systems thinking comes up with is that we all do systems thinking all the time, however much you don't know you are, you're thinking in a system way. But we have limited time to do it. 
and um, it's a very limited way of changing people as well. So can we work with that limitations around time and people? Often in organisational framework we're dealing with people all the way up a, a pecking order of a hierarchy. We interact a lot with those people immediately involved in the problem situation but they're not the ones making decisions. So we actually need to understand a great deal about the power and control systems within what we're dealing with. We often use obscure language and, and ideas. Uh, I think this is common to so much of the, 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 the problems with academic work and whatever is that we understand what we're talking about. It becomes really difficult to exchange those ideas with people involved directly with systems. Um, we often want simple solutions. But when you talk to people in business or um, in the world of dealing with face-to-face -face problems, they're looking for the instant solution, the one thing that will fix it. And most of the time, our analysis and systems is that there isn't one simple thing. It can't be even found as a set of things to do. You have to find a way of getting this to emerge by, by itself. Um, yeah, so those are lots of different problems we have to deal with. So, I'm going to change the subject completely. Have I got till two o'clock? Oh. Okay. Yes. Right. This is a, about a project I've been involved with, with um, Natural Resource Wales. And the starting point for this is phosphorus. Um, here's a little graph it's actually showing the production of phosphate in the United States of America and the projection, that red line, is the projection of, of where it's going. So we are, in the United States, running out of phosphate probably by the end of the century. And that pattern is pretty much the same for the rest of the world as well. Now, when you may ask, why is that so important? Well, most of the phosphate us comes from mining it, um, and without the phosphate fertiliser we apply into, into the land, <coughs> into our food systems, you'd see a fairly substantial decline in, in yields of food across the whole world. So um, here's a very classic example of what you might call a linear economy. We have these vast machines. I'd love to drive one of those machines, by the way, that's another life. <laughs> vast machine churning into the ground, digging up this phosphate rock, which is then crushed and processed and eventually ends up in bags like this, mixed in with nitrogen and potassium fertilizers and applied liberally to the land and our food grows that tall instead of that tall. Um, so that's, say, that's the, the starting point and, and, the, and the problem we have with it all is um, well, twofold. One was running out, but the other slightly significant problem is that the majority of that phosphate rock is in only one part of the world. Now, the majority of it, it comes from Morocco and the Western Sahara and areas like that, that all in concentrated. There are pockets around other bits where Russia's got some very good deposits, but they're of high quality, but they are very small compared to what Morocco has. So geopolitically, we are very vulnerable to phosphate. So that, to a certain extent, was a little bit of a starting point, a little bit of background to the project. Um, another bit of background to the project is the pollution of watercourses. That's sort of a lovely green scum across a little lake. And we've all seen it, haven't we? Yeah. We've all seen these areas. And if you actually look at any, any decent river, probably not at this time of year at the moment because they're full of silt and mud and everything else, but if you look at many, many rivers and streams, around in South Wales, or where I come from, Somerset. A lot of them are dead. We've got a river so from our village, and a friend of mine is an ecologist, and he points out how much of it is dead now. It's just flowing nicely. It looks good, but there's no hardly any life in it anymore. It's overloaded, completely overloaded, with the runoff from the fields. We've got a dairy area, and there's a lot of dairy farming going on. And you can actually see that it's a scum across the pebbles. Very little real life in it. So there's a really major problem of pollution. 
And Natural Resource Wales are charged with trying to do something about this, and they're working very closely with the farming community to try and see what we can do about it. And they have problems um, because we started off working with them thinking, well, let's just build a model of very simple top level, what is this system about? And very simply, we have the farming practices that are going on to produce a product, which in most of the cases we were dealing with is just dairy cows and milk, and obviously things down the line. Here. Part of that process produces pollution. Can't help it. That's the nature of cows. Um, you can either treat that as a byproduct, or it is pollution itself, and it just has to be dealt with. And that byproduct can be held for a while, it, it can be dispersed back to the land to, as an improver to the soil, and as long as we are doing that well managed, we can maintain the nutrient level, and it helps reduce the amount of phosphate phosphorus uh, fertilizers we put on that land to keep it going. So there's a byproduct which can start to turn this into a, a circular economy. But there's always the problem that some of it just runs off the land, and some of it runs out of the farm sheds. They collect it. You see sometimes these great big slurry tanks hidden away, and then every so often you'll be driving along a road behind a, a tanker that's hopefully going and delivering it into a field where it will spread the muck. It has been known for farmers to actually drive along the road and shoot it out the back anyway to try and get rid of it because there's too much of it. There's lots of this stuff, slurry stuff around. And we have the problem with the tanks, very large tanks. They're not looked after. They, sometimes they have a catastrophic collapse and a very large amount of sludge, slurry, goes into a river course and that will completely kill that river and it will take years and years to recover. So it's a really serious problem. It's perceived as a problem, which is quite an important point. But the real question was, how do you actually do something about, A, reducing the number of these big scale accidents, but also tackle what's called the diffuse pollution, which is spread out everywhere. So we start off by just modeling what's actually happening, trying to see what we can understand how we can identify the circularity that's needed in this system. Um, and we started to then think about more about the, the, the sort of institutions and the people involved. Um, I often use a, 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 an idea of game, and there are two types of games in this world. And there's, a, there's a lovely book called Infinite Games, Finite Games. Um, we have infinite games being played, and we have finite games. And the best analogy for this is, is um, I'll say, rugby, where I am. It's, it's more pertinent, but I often say football. Uh, rugby, where you have a game of rugby, it lasts for 80 minutes, and there's a winner or draw. There's an outcome, defined result. That is a game. But we have the infinite game of rugby, in quotes that goes on and on forever. It'll never finish. It's the game of rugby. And that's an infinite game. And the difference is that, you know, when we play a game of rugby, we abide by the rules. They are clear, defined. When we play in the infinite game of rugby, we're part of the process of thinking, are those rules right? Can we change them? And we have seen rugby rules change over the years. The game I used to play is very different to the game I saw last Saturday. So it's very different. And that's the difference between this, the infinite game of farming, as distinct from each individual farm, which is a game of its own. So that's, a, that's really an interesting way of getting people to think about what's going on in, in the farming community. It helps us also shape and define a really important systems concept of the, of the boundary what, what, what is it in the system of a concern today that we want to look at? How do we find that boundary? 
and and that's it's also you know it's, it's not just geographic it's it's what are the components that might be part of the important things to deal with um, we also deal with this concept that each farm is totally unique whether it's its history its size its topography the ecosystems that are going on there the neighbors of that farm the econ economics and the people Every single farm is totally unique. Um, and we often use things like this idea in systems thinking of cybernetics, idea of law of requisite variety, that says you can only really control that number of unique things if you have that number of unique methods of controlling it as well. So we've got to understand that we can't control it all directly. But we can start to identify patterns we can see patterns within each farm of the buildings, the infrastructure, the layouts of farms. There are set patterns, you can see. There are set patterns within the processes that are going on, the way the movement of materials and animals follows a pattern which is pretty similar across all those farms. And also, there are seasonal patterns all the time, particularly in farming. Activities are dictated by the seasons and the weather uh, and whatever. So there are sort of Although there is uniqueness and prolific variety, there are ways of actually starting to tackle that by looking at patterns within it. And I never realised that there are 18,500 registered farming units in Wales alone. So that gives you a sort of size of the problem we're dealing with. Um, which leads into a lovely part of systems thinking, which is called a drift into failure where when we see things break down, like these slurry tanks that suddenly breach, releasing large quantities of, of slurry, we look to see what are the components, what broke in that one, how can we fix it and learn from that one. Not knocking that because it's really important we do understand and we learn the lessons of each failure in that way. But we need to think more about how all the components, and these are often not just physical components, but they are the institutional and people components of that system, how do they change over time? Where do they lead to failure actually happening? And what we see so often in constructed systems is a drive for efficiency. We're pushing that farmer all the time through market mechanisms to produce milk cheaper and cheaper. So he's going to cut back on everything he does. If he can say, that tank looks all right, I'll leave it, maintenance on it for another year, he does so. He keeps getting that pressure on him all the time to be more efficient, to keep working with that process of, of generating the profit he needs just to keep running, let alone any profit to feed back into maintaining his buildings. And eventually we get to a point where there's a failure, and that failure happens. So a great deal of what we're trying to work with, with this is that kind of looking at how systems change over time and what are the pressures building on a system to do so. Um, Sidney Decker is, is the guy who's behind a lot of these concepts of drifting into failure. I would seriously recommend looking at him because it's, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, in, he doesn't like the idea of there's a bad apple in the system that causes the problems. He, sh he said, we should expect people to screw up. We must design for human error. Whatever it is we're doing, we've got to think that it will fail and it will be because of somebody making a mistake. But why did that mistake actually happen? Why do they not do that maintenance when they should have done? So it's always stepping back and looking at that bigger picture of what's causing these things to actually happen. What is solved in finding a person to blame, is what he would say. And again, it's this, this sort of, pictorially, we have a, a safety threat dodging around there. We've always got the ability to cope with it, but gradually we erode the norm of being able to cope with things until suddenly our safety threat breaches that and things go wrong. And it's a new formulation of Murphy's Law. Everything that can go wrong usually goes right, and then we draw the wrong conclusions but it always will go right. So, so um, with, this, with this project, we went through a process of looking at who's involved in it, who are the players. We did factor analysis, 
from deriving it from interviews and studies. We did some small systems mappings. I don't like big maps. I don't like spaghetti diagrams. I, you know, connect them all together into one big one if you need to, but the smaller the better. Integrate and validate those maps. Look at intervention points. And then try to sort of get out of that some key perceptions for the future. So those are the sort of stages we're looking at. And um, when it came to this particular problem, we had seven major areas of players involved. Um, those people affected by the pollution, and that included fishermen, people in the seas and in the rivers, the industry itself, government, regulatory processes, and so on. So on it went, lots of different people involved, and we draw out the connections and maps of all the organisations involved in it. We then looked at the factors involved, and we did this um, like all good systems thinking in this field. We organised workshops, we invited people concerned along to deal with it, and we ended up with a board of post-it notes. I've got five minutes. Right. So. We went through that process, defined the factors. I can go very quickly. We started to build models of the agriculture pollution itself. And that's about the level of detail I like in a systems model. We ended up looking at farming practices and how this leads into the problem. Issues around the intensification of the farms, the scale, the push towards bigger and bigger farming units leading to more problems. We came up with the idea of differentiating between the capacity of the farming, uh, farmer and his capability. So we mapped things out. We start to look for dimensions of things within it, that way. We put those models together, the, looking at the capability to control pollution, and we looked at the capability of cap the capacity to control pollution. So we joined those together, keeping them, again, reasonably simple systems maps. Um, and I shall jump down to that one. We look very much at this concept of point source failures. Uh, and at the end of the day, the important thing for me was that we were dealing with a group of people from very different areas, quite antagonistic in places. We had farming unions, we had the regulatory authorities, we had the NGOs very concerned with the pollution consequences. We were sharing ideas. We were getting them to talk to each other around a table. We, we used these sort of maps to help them see what was going on. And it was that process of trying to actually just get people to talk, share ideas, that leads to this way to identify places in the system to actually shift it. Um, and I shall click to there the end. So thank you very much for listening to me and uh, if you've got any quick questions, I guess. Thank you.